Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Colm Holland, and welcome this evening um, to our first of the Cowdre Hall Wellness, Virtual Wellness Program, I hasten to say. Well, while we're waiting for people to gather in, I'm, um, I'm guessing people are still working. You actually have to click the play button on the, on the middle of the video. It just doesn't play automatically on the page. Um, I, I'm going to use this time to thank lots of people who deserve thanking. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, all of you for joining me. We had over 250 people registering for this session tonight, so um, looking forward to meeting you all. Um, normally, of course, we would be uh, at Cowdray Hall. And I just want it for the record, I'm not actually in Cowdray Hall. Um, I'm at home. This is my office. Um, I, it's not a bad place, though. I'm just out of the window. I can see Glastonbury Tor if I climb to the top of the hill here. So I'm, I'm in rural Somerset. Um, I'd, I'd love to be uh, at Cowdray Hall, and um, I'm really hoping that as soon as we've got uh, the uh, the virus sorted out, then we'll all be able to meet again. It'd be great to meet, meet you. Um, but thanks for joining me today. Um, while we're still waiting for other people to come in, um, I, want, I want to thank the team at Cowdray, particularly Rachel and Ellie, um, who organized this and promoted it and have done a fantastic job in getting the, the, the word out there. I, especially, of course, Marina Cowdrey. Thank you, Marina, for um, your commitment to wellness and for the many years that you've been hosting uh, wellness uh, sessions uh, at Cowdrey Hall itself. And I know many of the people who are in the audience today um, have benefited from that. So thank you, Marina. And especially thank you so much for your enthusiasm for my book, The Secret of, of the Alchemist. Um, I, you, had, you got a copy before it was actually even published and you wrote some really um, moving things which encouraged me a lot to make me realize that uh, I, I'd done the right thing uh, by writing it. I also want to thank Richie um who's in my team for setting up this live um and the this live event on youtube this is the first time i've ever done a real live event on youtube so bear with me um if i uh, if i make a few mistakes but uh, this is the danger of broadcasting live just like the old days of black and white tv if you remember if you're old enough to remember those okay well we've um we've gone in a couple of minutes let's just have a quick look um, see if now's a good time to get, yeah, we're, we're three minutes in, so um, people can join us as they wish, and if you, if your computer crashes or you have to go and look after the kids, don't worry, this is going to be recorded, and you'll be able to uh, come back and, and watch this uh, later, it doesn't matter where, where you drop off. Um, I particularly also want to thank all my family and friends for supporting me Hi, everybody. You know who you are, and um, it's it's great to have you join me tonight. So who am I? <laughs> Some of you are wondering, who is this guy? So I'm Colm Holland. Um, that's an Irish name, pronounced Colm. Um, I'm an author. I've been a publisher. I'm starting to do some publishing again. I've been a teacher. Uh, I've been a marketer. And uh, most importantly of all, um, I'm an alchemy practitioner. And my life is pretty much devoted now to helping others discover what I call the unlimited power of unconditional love, which is really the bedrock, is it not, of wellness in general. And um, one of the things that we are going to do um, very briefly um, is outline what uh, I said I was going to uh, try and uncover today in this session. And I'll just quickly read it to you in the promotion. I said that I would uncover the secret of the Alchemist by Paolo Kahlo. Um, for those of you who have not read this book, there'll be a few of you left in the world, possibly, <laughs> who have never read it. If you have read it, can you just put something in chat now, like a thumbs up, yeah, love this book, read it, think it's amazing. Um, that, just give me an idea of, um, of, how, of, uh, of how many of you have read it. So I'm going to be uncovering a secret that I discovered in that book, which is why my book is called The Secret of the Alchemist, of course. And the reason I'm going to uncover that secret is because it reveals the treasure to what I believe is one of the most important things that any one of us can experience, and that is what I call true empowerment. 
And true empowerment is the ability to receive, but also to give unconditional love. It's what most of us yearn for. It is the, the, the rock bed of wellness and well-being, um, of mental health, of physical health uh, in so many ways. So we, we're going to have an, a closer look at that. Um, I'm also going to talk about some of the obstacles that we, we all find throughout our life that prevent us from moving into a place of true empowerment. It doesn't matter sometimes how hard we try, how, how hard we try and will it, how positively we think, how we try and uh, do the law of attraction and try and bring good things into our lives. Sometimes there are just those emotional feelings and fears and blocks that just stand in the way. Well, one of the things that I amazingly discovered that in The Alchemist is the answer to how those blocks can be removed and how we can you can actually move forward and, and overcome that. So we'll be talking about those as well. And then most of all, I am going to talk about how we can all harness unconditional love. Um, I sometimes call it unconditional love. Sometimes I call it unlimited love. Um, I, I Sometimes I call it undefeatable love because nothing can actually stand in the way of love. And um, I actually start my book with a quote. I'll, I'm going to read the one of the, the first things I put in, in my book. And I just want us to meditate, if if we will, just for a moment or two on, on these few thoughts. And then I'll dive in and start talking about the, the original book, The Alchemist. Um, it, it's right here in, in the, one of the frontest pages of, of my book. And I say this, that the greatest challenge we face is to truly believe at the very core of our heart that we are loved unconditionally for who we are and not for what we can do. So we've all had busy days. Some of you just put the kids to bed. Some of you have just finished watching um, the news. Um, I'm, I'm going to invite us just to all take one moment. Let's just take a breather for a second before we dive in. Let's just focus our minds and our hearts. I've actually lit a, a, a meditation candle here. So on behalf of everyone, um, I've, I've created a bit of a sacred space. But if you want to just close your eyes for a moment, um, if you'd like to shut the door so you can't hear what's going on in the other room, and just just sit with me for one second, because I, I want to think just for a moment about our relationship to love. One of the things I did today while you were busy doing what you were doing is I did take time out and I asked love to give every one of us in this session today um, everything that we would need to become the alchemists in our world. So just for one second, I'd love you to, to just meditate on this one thought that love is unconditional and I am the object of love's desire. Love is unconditional, and I am the object of love's desire. Okay. So let me tell you about The Alchemist. So I'm, I haven't just written about this book, and I'm not presenting this book tonight just because I think it's a great book. It's an amazing book. It's sold according to this edition. I remember this, this one was printed a few years ago. It says on the front, it has sold 65 million copies. I just did a quick Google, actually, while I was waiting for you all to join me, and there are only two other books um, around right now by a living author that – even come close to this one, of course, is Dan Brown, which you'd probably expect. Um, and uh, the other one is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So Dan Brown and J.K. Rowling are the only other two books that even come close in total sales. So that's that's one special thing about it. And by the way, this book belongs to my grandson, who is reading it to me at the moment. He says it's the best book ever written. Um, so forget about The Alchemist. Who am I to argue, really, um, with an eight-year-old who knows best? So and he's probably right, anyway. Um, the Secret of the Alchemist, 
was born out of an experience that I had with the author, Paolo Kahlo. So quick story. Those of you who know the story, bear with me just for a second. And for those of you who haven't, let me just tell you briefly what The Alchemist is about. So this is not a self-help book. Um, the reason why it's up there with Dan Brown and J.K. Rowling is because it is a fable. It is fiction. It's a story. It's a story of a shepherd boy called Santiago. And Santiago lives in Andalusia in Spain many years ago. And he's a shepherd. And he has a dream. And in this dream, a child appears to him and said that if you go to the pyramids in North Africa, you will discover your treasure, your real treasure. And if you don't go, you'll never discover it. And as he's dreaming, he starts to follow the child. But every time he follows the child, uh, he wakes up. He never actually discovers where his treasure lies. Eventually, he meets a guy called Melchizedek, who says, you if you really want to know what life's all about and you really want to find your treasure, then you need to do what it says. You need to follow your dream. And so he sells everything. He follows his dream. He gets on a boat. He goes up to Algiers and he ends up in North Africa and he goes through this incredible journey of trials and tribulations. He meets lots of great people along the way. It's a great adventure. And of course, eventually he ends up at the pyramids. Um, and if you don't want to know the end of the story and you've never read it, plug your ears now because I'm going to spoil it for you. So, uh, yeah, plug your ears. He doesn't find the treasure at the pyramids, of course. He is told, and if you read the story, you'll discover how, that the treasure actually lies back in Andalusia in a deserted church where he fell asleep under the sycamore tree. That's where the treasure is buried. Now, this story landed on my desk back in 1993, 28 odd years ago, when I was a publisher for HarperCollins Publishers in Sydney, Australia. And it was, I, I can remember it as if it was yesterday, <laughs> to, to coin the phrase. Um, it was late on a Friday afternoon. The post guy came in and he dumped a pile of manuscripts on my desk, literally, and said, you know, here's, here's your weekend homework column. And I said, oh, thanks very much. And I, it was in the days before email, of course. So everything, we had to wait for everything to come by post. And as I was waiting through, uh, there, was a, there was one particular manuscript, that, the cover of which caught my eye. And here it is. The Alchemist by this unknown author, Paolo Kahlo. Um, something about that cover I broke. The first rule of publishing is never judge a book by its cover. I love this cover, the shepherd boy, the, the, the Arab figure with one eye, the saber saw, the sun and the moon. Something resonated. And I thought, OK, I'm going to break my rule. I'm going to take it home. And uh, Sunday afternoon, I'm sat in my backyard in Sydney and I'm, I pick up this manuscript and I start to read. Now, I worked out I was probably only the fifth person to read it in the English language. It hadn't been published yet. It had been published in Portuguese, uh, in Brazil. And this was the first time it had been translated into an, another language. And I remember the, the time almost stood still and I got to the final page, literally in one sitting. And I knew, I just had this knowing, partly because of a journey that I had been on since about the age of 18. And, and by the way, in 1993, I was 40-something. <clears throat> and um, so it was as if there was somebody speaking to my very soul in a way that I'd not really experienced from something as, as a small fable like this before. I was really excited. I got on the phone to my colleague in California who normally would say to me, okay, Colin, how many copies do you want for Australasia? Um, 200, 300, what are you thinking? And I said, 200,000? <laughs> I heard him spit his coffee out on the phone and uh, he said, are you drunk? I said, no, you're kidding. It's, uh, it's way too early for that. Um, he said, are you serious? I said, this is going to be one of the best-selling books that HarperCollins has ever published, ever. And he said, OK, uh, let me go and talk to the rest of the guys around the world. Let's see what they, they think as well. And history is, is really uh, ha has the story from now on. 
probably, even though it says 65 million, we think it's more like if you count all the Kindle versions and the audiobook versions, it's probably around 100, over 100 million copies. Uh, probably four times as many people have, have read that. He still holds the Guinness Book of Records for um, the most copies of a single book translated into foreign languages, 74 different foreign languages. So it, it was it was certainly a phenomenon, and um, you know, it, whilst I'm, it's a real you know, gratifying feeling to to know that I was one of the first people to sort of see its potential. What I didn't know was the word of my enthusiasm got back to Paolo himself, who of course was a pretty unknown author at the time, and. We'd invited him to come to Australia, and he came to Australia, and he was at the Adelaide, Adelaide Writers' Festival. And the queue for people to get the book signed went outside the building and round the block. Nobody had ever seen that before, certainly not in Adelaide anyway. Um, and they, um, they said this is the best book they'd ever read. So many people were saying, you know, can you sign four copies, five copies? I mean, people were wanting to give this book away to other people. And um, he came, Paolo and his wife came back to Sydney on his way back to Brazil and um, called in and said that he wanted to take myself and my wife and the publicity director and her partner um, out for a meal, which was great. I mean, to be frank, m most authors don't do that. Um, so he said, well, awesome. This will, this, will be, this will be interesting. And uh, he said, uh, apparently to my publicity director, and I, I've got a, a thank you gift for you both. And I thought, well, it's even more, getting even more exciting. So we had a great evening. We went out in Sydney and um, halfway through the evening, he uh, took, took a, out of his pocket um, a small jewelry box and put it in front of, of my publicity director and said, you know, uh, I really want to give you this because you've looked after us so well, which she did. She does a fantastic job. And she opened it and there was this dress diamond ring worth a few thousand dollars, I hasten to add. Um, and I thought, wow. And we all clapped and she was in tears. And, and that's the kind of guy Paolo is. That's the sort of effect he has on people. And then he looked at me and he said, Colin, he said, um, I'm, I'm really thrilled um, to hear the, of your enthusiasm. And I'm so grateful that, that actually you're the first person in the publishing house or any real publishing house who has been so as enthusiastic and i and i heard about that phone call you made to greg and um and i want to and i want to thank you and i've asked god and the universe what i should give you he said the same to uh, my colleague and she got a diamond ring and i'm thinking oh hmm gold rolex <laughs> that would that would be nice how shallow is that isn't that terrible i'm embarrassed anyway but it was symbolic and i'll, I'll explain that in a moment um, and he said, so God told me that I should spend a day of my time doing my alchemy magic just for you. You've read my book, haven't you, The Pilgrimage? He said, yes, I have. So he said, well, you know that I'm a magician. And I said, yes, <laughs> very cautiously. I'd never met a magician before. Um, not this kind of magician anyway. Um, and this one wasn't made, you know, this one wasn't full of tricks. This was the real deal. And he said, so I've, so I have, I, I've called on the universe um, to give you whatever you want in your life from this moment onwards. The only thing is you just need to decide what it is that you want. And I'm thinking, God, Rolex. And I'm thinking, that's not really the right answer, is it? <laughs> that's not really what I want. What do I really want? So I remember driving home, and my wife and I were laughing about you know, what happened. And, and I said, what did you think about what Paolo said? And she said, quite wisely, she said, well, it doesn't really matter what I think, does it? it? It's what you think matters. And I just want to pause there for a moment, because that question that Paolo asked me is probably one of the most important questions that any of us can ask ourselves. And I'm so grateful that he he brought that into my consciousness um, to, to make me answer that. What is it that we really want in our life? Are we able to fill our life with materialism? Are we able to fill our life with distractions of various descriptions? Or do we really want the very best for ourselves in the same way that love wants the best for ourselves. 
So you're probably wondering what happened next. So I didn't get a gold Rolex, didn't materialize. And I kind of forgot, I'll be frank, I kind of forgot about that evening. I was just taken away with my work and so on. Um, but then as the days and the weeks progressed, the thought of, of his his question would keep coming back and coming back. You know, what do I really want? And, and what I discovered was that gradually over the two or three weeks afterwards, I found this new courage that had not been there before to say, well, you know what I really want is I want to start my own business and I want to be my own boss and I want to make a difference in the world from my own efforts rather than working for other people all the time. And, and within the space of several months, stuff began to happen. This was my first real understanding of omens and synchronicity. And as these things began to take place, for example, the two guys who were superior to me, who I used to answer to in the publishing company, both got jobs somewhere else. And without me even realizing it, I, I was promoted up to sales and marketing director of the company. And even as that was happening, I, was, I wasn't really associating it with what Paolo had said, because deep down, I was still not doing what I really wanted to do. And the moment I made, made the decision, this is what I really want to do, I'm going to set up my own business. It was as if by magic, stuff began to fall into place. And within the space of three years, we, myself and, and a couple of partners, we had one of the most successful digital marketing companies in the whole of Australia. And I remember going to the bathroom and staring in the mirror and, and saying to myself, how on earth did you get here? You were a lowly little middle manager in a publishing company, and now you're running the Sydney Olympics, 2000 Olympics online, together with the whole of Toyota's work and so on and so on, all these major companies that we were working for. How, how did that happen? And it was as if the penny finally dropped that when Paolo said that if I could just decide what I wanted, he had performed the magic that would bring that into being. And that opened up from that day onwards, a whole new vista, a whole new dimension of, of the way of living and the way of seeing how the universe and how love in particular really does want the best for us. If, we can just decide what it actually is that we want. So that's that's the story um, of of my encounter with the with the alchemist. And I just want to um, go on to talk about a few other things. Um, I actually want to also talk about a story that's in the book because I want to talk next about true empowerment and what it is and, and what it looks like. So I'm, I'm just quickly going to read a little note here which I've marked. Um, if, you, if you've got a, got a copy of my book, you'll be able to follow this at some point. But I, this is all about what love actually is and how love is the root of us entering into a life of fulfillment and of joy and of true empowerment. And it says this, that love cares for us beyond measure. Love never gives up on us. Love constantly wants the best for us, constantly forgives us, never judges us, is full of compassion and mercy, feels our pain and our joy, and loves us deeply. It is revealed through action, and this is my definition of love, and it knows no bounds, and it is always unchanging. So how, do, how does my definition of love tie in with what I was saying earlier about true empowerment and the story of, of the alchemist? So I came to this conclusion very simply that I went back to the alchemist and I began to look at the story and I said, there's got to be more to this book than just a fable. There has to be something in here that is going to reveal how I can also live a life where I can perform the kind of magic that Paolo performed for me. And I 
delve in. And the, there are three things that, that came pretty obviously to me. And if, you, and if you've already discovered this for yourself in the army, then forgive me. But I, for those of you who haven't read it or haven't really thought about it too much, let me tell you what I found. Three things. The first is that this is really the hero's journey. Those of you who know Joseph Campbell, those of you who are fans of Star Wars will know that Joseph Campbell influenced that. And that the hero's journey is one of the, uh, what Joseph Campbell calls the monomyths of literature and art. In other words, all cultures, whether ancient or modern, uh, Western, Eastern, all have at the core one common theme running through their mythology, and it's the hero's journey. The hero's journey is, as I described, the journey that Santiago went on. And then I thought, well, there's something more going on here, and that is that Santiago ends up back where he started, back in under the sycamore tree, in the deserted hut. So what is that about? And then another light came on, is that this is really an, an in a fable interpretation of Carl Young's process of individuation. Now, those of you who know and love Carl Jung, like I do, um, the association is all there. So the treasure that Santiago is going off to discover is actually an inward journey of personal transformation. And the final treasure that he discovers at the end of that journey is, of course, in Jungian terms, his true self. So the journey is a journey from the conscious into the unconscious. It is a journey from the light, sometimes into the dark of the shadow self. And those are the places where Santiago has to face his fear and where he discovers more than anything else that the secret of, of alchemy, which is also a process, which I'll mention in a moment, is actually to discover the power of unconditional love. And I'm going to read a, a piece of that to you uh, before we finish this evening. The, the power of unconditional love is sits at the very heart of the ancient principles of alchemy. For those of you that have never really thought about alchemy or never talked about alchemy, um, the, the key character in this book, of course, is an alchemist. Those of you that have read it know that Halfway through the story, Santiago arrives at an oasis and there was this main character, the alchemist, who's waiting for him to help him take the last stretch of his journey. And what I realized, looking back a, a couple of years after I met Paolo, is that in my middle age, I was Santiago arriving at midpoint in his life in the oasis, which is comfortable, there's dates, there's water, there's, there's love, there's friends, uh, he meets his wife there, and everything is fine, except he still hasn't really found his true self. He hasn't really fulfilled his true ambition. And that was me. And so at, in a way, Paolo, when he came and to Sydney that day, he was the alchemist for me and encouraged me to not just sit back on my laurels and say, okay, I've, I've done everything that I, that I need to do in life. Because it wasn't true. I still had a yearning to, that I could do and perform more and I could make a change in the world around me. So alchemy is the secret, um, if you like, of the alchemist, even though it's fairly obvious in there. Because if you study alchemy, which, which I've now done and, and which is one of the things I teach, at great length now, is that at the heart of alchemy is not that we are trying to create the philosopher's stone as a material uh, object. We need to become the philosopher's stone. Those of you who know Jung will know that he discovered that the real um, work of the alchemist, the great work, was in fact to try and purify and uh, transform or transmute, as they called it, uh, the lead of their souls into the gold. And when I look back on my life, when I started to read The Alchemist, I think, yeah, this is this is what I've been doing for so long. Um, 
there are three stages, and I just want to share this with you quickly because um, those of you who are interested in, in finding out more, um, I can give you a few tips along the way. And so the, the tip one is that don't, um, don't try personal transformation towards your true self unless you're totally committed to it. And why, why am I saying that? Well, it's quite obvious. Um, the first stage is called the black phase. And the black phase is where we allow our own ego, our psyche, to be combusted or destroyed or reduced down to its absolute bare elements. And take it from me, and I'm sure there are many of you who, who can put your hand up and say, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Colin. Um, some people call it the dark night of the soul. Yes, they do. But in that dark night of the soul, that is the only journey. That is the only route to finding love at the heart of our own soul and to find the ability for that love to heal those parts that we really despise, that we reject, that we don't want to admit to, that we find um, shameful. Love doesn't judge those parts, but until we are prepared to face them, it's really hard to allow love which is what the alchemists call prima materia. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a second. Allow love to, to shine a light into the dark shadow of our unconscious. It's painful, and it's painful for a reason, and that's because sitting underneath the pain, there is always a wound of some description. And who wants to reopen wounds? Who wants to revisit those, those, those parts? But th this, is, this is the rub. Those wounds, those painful parts are the very things that are stopping us from moving forward and onward into true empowerment. If you like, we're robbing ourselves of our own true destiny. We are robbing ourselves of our own personal legend. So the only way out, as somebody said to me the other day, is through, and it's absolutely true, we have to go down into the, into the black phase. And the alchemist used to perform this in their laboratory. So what Carl Jung said is that when the alchemists were doing their laboratory work and trying to reduce lead into, into gold by heating it and heating it and melting it and heating it and getting it down to its core elements, what, what the alchemist was really doing is was turning himself into the philosopher's stone, and that was stage one. So at the end of stage one, we're then holding in our own hands, under our own control, the most vulnerable and delicate parts of our existence, of our psyche. And the second stage of alchemy is the white phase. And in the white phase, which they call purification, this is the phase where we need to invite all of the power of prima materia, which the alchemists, that was their name for unconditional love, to heal and to um, embrace and to fill the void of our vulnerability with love. And that's why I started with that quote tonight, is that unless we allow love to embrace us in our deepest self, it is really hard for us to move on and move forward. So power of unconditional love doesn't start with us trying to love other people unconditionally ourselves. It starts really simply with allowing love to immerse us in the deepest and most vulnerable parts of our psyche. And of course, this is what Carl Jung taught as well, except I'm probably emphasizing the power of unconditional love more than, than, than Carl Jung, Jung did. Um, so that's the white phase. Lastly, there's the red phase. So black phase breaking down the psyche into its core elements. The white phase, we identify the most vulnerable parts of ourselves and we allow love to, to enable us to love and embrace them. And here's the secret, really, of the alchemist, is that these most vulnerable, most sacred, the parts we most despise will become our greatest treasure because this is the heart of our true self. People often say to me, you know, Colin, you're amazing. I don't know how you can stand up in front of people and talk about it and make yourself so vulnerable. And, and I said, well, that's because I, I've been here. I've done this. 
what I discovered when I was going through the black and the white phase in my life is that um, my mother, who I love dearly, uh, suffered uh, really badly from severe epilepsy. And I had forgotten, completely wiped out of my any adult memory, the fact that she, when she had an epileptic fit, she used to um, open the cupboard. I was about two or three years old, and she would put me in the cupboard under the stairs and lock the cupboard while she was trying to control herself. And fortunately, eventually, it was discovered what her problem was. But in, in a, and and she had uh, medication and it, and it was solved. But this person who um, one minute adored me would become this tyrant and and would blame me for absolutely everything and physically push me into the cupboard and lock it. And of course, you can imagine my surprise later when I read Harry Potter and discovered that he had a, a cupboard under the stairs experience as well. Sheer coincidence. But. Um, it wasn't until I was prepared to go and visit that child, that inner child, and let him express the wounds and the pain that he experienced at that point, that I was actually able to come out of myself. So I often say to people, the, the person who you're listening to now, this person who's, who's explaining all this, that's my inner child. He, he, he's the one with the power. He's the one with the voice. Your inner child is the one who's going to take you forward in power and in love to the place of true empowerment where you want to. You can't get there without taking that wound and that pain with you. And that's why I love unconditional love, because it has the power to enable us to make that move. So we end up in the red phase. And the red phase is all about... Um, allowing our uh, newfound power and the and the power of unconditional love, which now sits within us, to bring about change in the world around us. And I'm going to go back to Carl Jung, and then I'm going to read you this wonderful bit from the end from the end of the Alchemist, because this illustrates this uh, complete. Carl Jung talked about um, active imagination. He said and believed that the unconscious part of our mind is the is the veil that is closest to the, the power that sits within all of the universe, material and immaterial, uh, bodily and uh, body and soul, um, and that if we can learn to harness the power of the unconscious using the, the power of unconditional love, which is what I talk about all the time, then we are able to make changes to the world around us, to ourselves first, of course, to the world around us for the better. Call it magic, call it miracles, call it manifestation. It doesn't really matter what name we give it. This is the power that we as individuals hold and can exercise if we are truly committed to do the great work. So those three stages, the black, the white, and the red stage, are what the alchemists used to call the great work. And at the end of the great work, when we're in the red phase, the universe will give us the opportunity to exercise that power. And there's this wonderful scene, which I'm, I'm going to read to you now, that by Paolo, which I'm, I know um, is something that, that he went through. It's, it's a, a, a metaphorical way of, of describing the exercise that we can all engage in to make a shift in our own consciousness and into the consciousness of the world around us. At the end of the book, the alchemist and Santiago end up uh, being captured by some marauding bandits. The, the world is full, the desert's full of marauding bandits uh, in this story. And the bandits are going to kill them. And two things happen. One is that the alchemist gives them the gold that um, Santiago had managed to collect along the way. So he's now lost everything all over again. And the alchemist says that this boy, Santiago, um, he's an alchemist. In fact, he's so good at, at being an alchemist, he can actually turn himself into the wind. And he can even destroy your camp by becoming the wind. Of course, the bandits say, yeah, right. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, we've got to see this. This is this is something. This is going to be something else. And, um, and of course, Santiago has no idea how to turn himself into the wind and how to destroy the camp. But the alchemist says to him, I am going to invoke on your behalf, just like Paolo did for me back in 1993. I'm going to invoke on your behalf all the power of the universe, which is already within you, so that you can perform this great test. And so the story goes, the first day the boy goes out, stands on the edge of the desert, looks out, and he starts talking to the wind. And he manages to get the wind's agreement to help him. And so the wind blows and blows up the desert, the desert sand, and it covers the sun, and he starts to talk to the sun. And he says to the sun, there's only one problem with you and the universe, if I might be so bold to say, is that you don't understand love. You don't really understand the creativity of love, of unconditional love. That's what we humans are here for. That's our place. This is our place. This is our role in life. This is what you and I are here for. This is what we're meant to be doing with our, with our lives. And he tells this great story that um, as he start, spoke to the son, the son said, well, you need to speak to the hand that wrote all. And those of you who know the story will love, love me as I read this. Because only the hand that understands all knew that everything was made by a larger design and that had moved the universe to a point at which six days of the creation had evolved into what the alchemist called the masterwork. And the boy reached through to the soul of the world and saw that it was part of the soul of God. And he saw that the soul of God was his own soul. And that he, a boy, could perform miracles. So that's my encounter with the alchemist, uh, with Paolo Kahlo. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I, I could go on all night, and I don't want to bore you. Um, there's lots of other things I'm sure you need, you need to get to do, but I hope that's been helpful. Um, I hope that you've um, gained something out of this. I noticed we've got um, some, some questions um, in, uh, in the chat. Um, what, what I just want to say before we get into the questions, if, that if you like my book, uh, what I've sort of explained so far, um, you can buy paperback, we've got Kindle, we've got an audio book, um, it's all on Amazon. Uh, we've been in the top 50, <laughs> amazingly, uh, for the last six months. Thanks, Gavin, for all your hard work. I know Gavin's listening, my uh, publicity director. Thank you so much. Uh, we've done a great effort all around and the team. Um, the other thing is that I've got signed copies. We've got one box left of the first edition, which looks like this. Um, if you go to my website, and uh, which is colmholland.com, uh, I'm quite happily sell you a, a signed copy of the first edition. It's going to be worth millions one day, of course. <laughs> um, and um, I'd, I'd love to know what you think of it. I'd, I'd love people to feedback. Um, we've got lots, lots of reviews on Amazon. Um, I'm, we're all learning something new from it every day. Um, the other thing is that I am launching a school in about two weeks' time. And again, if you go to my website and click on uh, contact and leave your details, we'll quite happily send you details about the school. It's um, uh, pretty much the equivalent of an open university uh, module uh, with five sections and three or four lessons in e each section. And I will, um, it's called the School of Alchemy Transformation. And in that school, I will be um, giving live webinars. We'll be studying together. Uh, I'll be sharing all that I know about Carl Jung and all I know about Paolo and his magic and, and how we can enter into that as well. So um, <laughs> somebody's saying, if, this is so lovely, please don't stop. Well, uh, if you please don't feel that um, you're being rude by leaving now. If you want to leave, that's fine. But I, I'm going to try and uh, answer some of these questions. Um, somebody here saying, how can we feel unconditional love in this 3D your plan isn't it when we accept that we also love with conditions as both sides must manifest 
um, and exist in this dual world? Yeah, great question. I battle, thanks Marie, uh, Marie's asked this question. Um, I battle with this one a lot. In fact, it was only yesterday, so your, your question is very tiny. Only yesterday I was, I was thinking about this in great depth and my son Richie and I have had long conversations about duality and so on. If, if we're going to follow Carl Jung's teachings, um, duality, as you perceive it, and as most of us, I, I perceived it this way as well, the duality of, of the, the, you know, the world out there and the world in here and the world of the spirit and the, the world of, um, all, of all the, the manipulation of machinations that people try and put on us and society and so on and create, can create this dualistic existence. Well, Carl Jung, Carl Jung would say that actually... What we're doing there is we're projecting a lack of unity within our own being. So to take him literally, he would say that the duality lives between the conscious and the unconscious. And uh, the alchemists understood this really well. I mean, they had lots of symbols for this. They had the moon and the sun, uh, the, the female and the male, for example, uh, they often saw it in terms of male and female energy, and because Carl Jung talked about male and female archetypes as well. Uh, so, yeah, in my book, I, I talk quite a bit about this. Um, but what Jung would say, and, and I think I agree with him on this totally, is that it's the, the art of individuation, the art of maturation, the art of finding the true self and being free from apparent duality is to deal with the duality within our own psyche. If we can embrace the negativity, if we can embrace, uh, there's this lovely scene, for example, in, in The Alchemist where the, the hawks are fighting. If we can embrace the, the even the violence in our own psyche, if we can ab ab embrace the abuse we put up upon ourselves in our psyche and the shame, um, and embrace that and allow the other part of our being that, that's full of unconditional love to accept and to merge those two together, then in my experience, um, there is no differentiation between the, the soulful life that I live and the physical life that I live. I don't experience it, and this is all very Buddhist, of course, and I apologize to my Buddhist friends uh, for not giving credit where credit is due as well. But um, this, this, is, this has been my experience. So the more time I spend, the more time I invest in working with my own unconscious and those parts of my unconscious that, that I find will creep in and, and challenge uh, my happiness at the drop of a hat, um, rather than trying to keep pushing them away and pushing them down by embracing them, then I find that the duality within myself begins to dissipate. I instantly find uh, a, a deeper happiness and joy, and I can embrace and, and almost tolerate, not put up with um, abuse that's going on in the world around, because that needs to be stood up against. I'm not for one moment advocating that there's anything uh, that, that we shouldn't stand in the way of injustice and abuse. We, we should stand absolutely in the way of it. Um, but we don't need to feel defeated by it. That's my my take on that. Um, thanks, Mary. I hope I hope that kind of us. If it doesn't, please email me, um, column at columnholland.com, and I'm quite happily to uh, keep that conversation going because it's such a great question. Um, there was one other which I, I saw um, earlier. Um, just finished The Alchemist, loved it, but I think I probably need to reread it a few times. Lisa, may I be so bold as to suggest that if you, before you read it again, <laughs> read this book um, because it will shed um, extra light on, on The Alchemist. I think you'll get twice as much, if not more, uh, out of the so you know the kind of the idea is that, that this is a companion book to the original. Um, I didn't see it straight away. It took me two years to realize that actually this was a, a manual on al alchemy itself. Um, even though it's the title and even though the main character is an alchemist, yeah, it took me quite a while. Um, I'm you know generally slow on the uptake, so maybe others have got came to that conclusion much much quicker than I did. Um, okay, I think we're probably done here. 
um, I'm going to finish with a promise that I make in my book, and I'm going to finish with it here because I did spend most of today on your behalf calling on unconditional love to, to, to enable you to give you everything that you need to enter into a life of joy and fulfillment and uh, everything that the universe wants for you even more than you what we want it for ourselves so um blessings thank you for listening um i hope you enjoy my book and if you want to stay in contact with me just go to columnholland.com there's a contact form there I i'd love to hear from you have a great and blessed evening everyone thank you for being here <laughs>